Hey folks, give me a second here to share my screen, I'm sure everyone can see that properly. So uh, yeah, I'm Marvin from the Stack Foundations. I'm the technical lead, so I help out with integrations and I assist teams with their architectural decisions when writing smart contracts and whatnot. Uh, Stax is a blockchain with some unique properties. I was told you guys are quite technical, so we're just gonna jump straight in. As you can see, there's a code editor right here. So uh, let's just jump in. Okay, so um, before I start writing here, let's quickly talk about what Stacks really is for those of you that haven't come across it yet. Uh, Stacks is a blockchain with a rather unique property in that it anchors itself to Bitcoin, which means that any blocks that are produced on the Stacks chain are eventually finalized on the Bitcoin chain. Uh, that gives it a lot of very, very interesting properties, one of which is of course that it leverages Bitcoin security, but another one is the fact that uh, all the, the entire chain and all its forks are also public on the Bitcoin chain. So uh, the way that works is through a consensus mechanism called proof of transfer. We won't get into that right now because that is a topic of its own. Uh, but what I thought would be fun to do is to write a basic smart contract and what better to write than an NFT contract since that's all the craze right now. So let's get started with that. So. In the Stacks ecosystem, we have a few different uh, development tools. Uh, the, one of the favorites is called Clarinet. So its uh, purpose is to write, test, uh, debug smart contracts. Uh, the language that you use for Stack smart contracts is called Clarity, a non turing complete language, uh, Lisp-based, as you'll see. Uh, and, and yeah, just a very interesting language that is really built as a response to many of the issues that different contracts, different languages have run into. So uh, we use Clarinet. Clarinet, you can compare to sort of as the, the truffle of stacks, if you're familiar with the Ethereum ecosystem. So truffle and Ganache, those are, imagine those two combined, that's Clarinet. So let's uh, create a new project here and we'll call that my NFT, very original name. It's gonna create a bunch of directories here. Um, I'll move these up one to make it a little easier to manage for us. So I'll move my NFT up to here and then delete the my NFT folder. So now we're set with a few different files here. So Clarinet creates a file, clarinet.toml, this is our configuration file, contracts directory, which is empty, test directory, which is empty, and settings, which we'll, we'll get to at some point. So uh, let's start by creating our first contract here. So I'm gonna write clarinet contract new, and I'm just gonna call this uh, Marvin NFT, because why not? Create an NFT about myself, must be valuable. Uh, it creates another few boilerplate files here, as you can see. So we have our contract.clar file. Uh, we have a test file that's filled in with uh, some boilerplate code as well, which uh, we can discuss in a little bit. And here's my NFT file. So uh, as I said, Clarity is a Lisp-like language, uh, which makes it a little bit different from what most people are used to. So before I start writing any code, I can drop into a session here and I can actually start writing clarity on the consoles to be able to try this out. So uh, let's not care about what we see right here. So let's start with some basics. So you all know how addition works. So addition in clarity looks a little bit different like so. Uh, and that's because it's a Lisp-like language. So for those of you who are very unfamiliar with this, how you should read this is that the first character here is the, the function name, if you will, and then the other two are the parameters that you pass in. So I'm passing in a U4 and a U5. What does the U stand for? Unsigned. So if I take these two out and I redo the same thing, now I'm talking about signed integers here. So you can see that uh, Clarity is a strongly typed language. So this is how you can express different things. And there are all these features that you might expect from a language like this as a Lisp-like language. So we won't uh, think about that for too long because we only have 10 minutes here and we still have to write our contract. So I'm going to implement a basic NFT. Now, the cool thing is that on the Stacks uh, blockchain and, and Clarity is an ecosystem that the uh, NFT functionality is actually built into the language. So we have functions like uh, NFT mint and NFT burn, NFT transfer, the same for fungible tokens. Uh, and those functions take care of a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the things that people do wrong. So if you look at Ethereum, uh, the history of Solidity development, how um, you know if you do something the wrong way around, so you deduct the balance first and then, and then you transfer something or the other way around that can cause some issues. Uh, managing the balance sheet, that's what those functions do for you. So. Basic NFT then, 
as you can see, I can define a non-fungible token and I can call this Marvin NFT. I have to give it an identifier type. So let's say that these NFTs are identified by an unsigned integer. This is all I would have to do. So there you go, you have an NFT, great. Um, but if, obviously this NFT cannot do anything at all. So what we need is a public interface, a few public functions so that we can make this NFT do some fun stuff. So transfer it out, check who the owner is, you know, the things that you usually care about when you're dealing with NFTs. So for that, we have to obviously conform to a specific standard. So uh, again, people in the Ethereum space, they might know ESC 721 is an NFT standard in, in Ethereum. We have a similar one called SIP9. Uh, so we're going to be implementing a SIP9 token. So the first thing I want to do here is create another new contract. So Clarinet contract new, and I'll call this SIP009 NFT uh, trade. So it's gonna create these files. And then I'm going to copy in this trade and take a really quick look at it. So here's our trade. So a trade defines the public interface of a contract uh, in Clarity. So what this trade says is like, well, there's a trade called SIP009 NFT trade, and it has these public functions that I have to define. And then it defines what the input values are. So there's nothing here, there's you and there, and it defines what the response type is of this particular function. So think about that for a little bit, but uh, since we're pressed for time, we will, we will carry on. So now that I have this NFT here, first thing I'm gonna do is actually um, write down that my contract here implements this particular trade. So I'm gonna write SIP009 NFT trade dot SIP009 NFT trade. So this references this trait that I have right here. First is the contract name, then it's the trade name. So a contract can contain multiple traits, obviously. So I have it in here. Now I can use Clarinet to actually check if my, uh, if my contract is correct. So right now it says uh, analysis error, use of undeclared trade, SIP 009 NFT trade. So let's take a look here. Might've made a mistake in my spelling, 009 NFT trade. Check my Tomo file here to be sure. Um, that seems to be correct. So that's probably an ordering issue. So I have to write that this one depends on a different contract, which is that one. Let's run it again. Perfect. Now we are where we're supposed to be. Okay. So now I run this check and I have three minutes to get this done. Uh, it says analysis error, invalid signature for method. So now it actually checks this uh, against the trade and says like, well, we're missing all these functions that I need to actually uh, make this make this work. So I will have to define all these different functions. And uh, since we're pressed for time, I will start copying some of these in to give you a basic idea. Hey, Marvin, by the way, you actually have a good amount of time. Um, don't don't rush too much. If there's anything like specific that you think is interesting that you want to expand on, you you have a little bit of time to do so. So, don't, got it. Don't rush. Too okay. Much. Yeah. Got you're, it. You're good. Well, you're good. You never we're know all, how strict all, so how strict people are at the time, eh? No, it's all good. It's all good. We're all we're all deep into it and enthralled. So don't skip over the interesting stuff just for us. Wonderful. Well, then, then I should I should get back to writing some of these things out. Um, I pasted it in so we can we can talk over it a little bit and then and then we can see how far we get so we can still interact with this contract. I think that will that will save us a couple minutes as well. So um, let's make this a little bit smaller. So what I just did is I just pasted in a reference NFT and and you can see how quite succinct this is. So it's very very short, um, but. Since press for time, I'm not going to write this out manually. You know, I'll copy it over and then we'll go over it. Uh, we can we can see how all of this goes together. So before we checked out this trade, and we have these four functions that we have to implement. So we have get last token ID, which returns the last token ID limited to this U and range, right? Because every token is identified by an unsigned integer. Uh, get token URI very similar to like a metadata URL that you see in any NFT. Uh, getting an owner. So we're passing in a number that says like, hey, who's the owner of NFT number U5? And then finally transfer an NFT to a different owner. So it takes a uint, so a, uh, a token ID, transfer token U6 uh, from a sender to a receiver. So a sender and a recipient. And these are principles. So principles are like addresses. Could be a contract address or, or a standard address but that has a private key. So we call these principles. So here are then the functions that we have implemented to create our basic NFT. So uh, what we want to start with here is we have our token definition here, which we say like there's a Marvin token with an unsigned integer as a type. 
then we define a data variable, last token ID, that is the unsigned integer starting with zero, that's just gonna count up. So every time we mint an NFT, we're gonna increment that number. Uh, then here is our first function that is part of the trade. So get last token ID, all it has to do is a var get, it's gonna read this last token ID and it's gonna return with a uh, positive and okay value. So it's either an okay on error type, uh, people that have programmed in Rust before will find this familiar. You either return a result that's an OK or an error. Then there's another read-only function here, get token URI. This token sadly does not have a website. It's a very poor token. We have a read-only get the current owner of a token ID. And you see, again, very simple. Since this balance sheet uh, stuff is built into the language, we just do NFT get owner and we can query the owner. Transfer, likewise, quite simple. We have our built-in transfer function, but we do see a little bit of a difference here. So um, since an NFT by itself is just a token, it doesn't have anything that relates to like an ownership model. That's something that we come up with ourselves. So is this a token that only the owner can transfer or is this an NFT that I use for something else? You know, there could, there could be reasons why you want to come up with a different ownership model. So the language doesn't do that for you. So what I do right here is I make an assertion that the sender is actually equal to the transaction sender. So Solidity space, message.sender, same thing here. So I just checked that the sender and TX sender are the same. If I take this out, it would mean that anyone is actually able of transferring out my NFT, which is not great, at least not in this case. And then finally, I have a convenience function, the convenience function that I declared here uh, that just mints a particular NFT to a recipient. So it actually counts up that number. So uh, you see that I define a variable, you do that using let. So I define a variable called token ID, which I set equal to the var get last token ID increment by one. Uh, I make an assertion that the TX sender has to be the contract owner. So that is the principle that actually deployed this contract. Then I try to mint this token. Uh, so you see an NFT mint. This try right here is uh, error handling. So if the NFT mint fails, then I exit the function right here and, and uh, the transaction reverts. If that goes well, then we get to the var set. I up increment the last token ID and then I just return the last token ID as a convenience. So let's quickly do a clarinet check, make sure that the contracts are, yeah, they're, they're fine. So I'll go into a console session right here. So clarinet console is pretty cool. So thanks to it being a Lisp-like language, it's very easy to create a raffle and, and uh, build stuff on top of that. So what clarinet actually allows you to do is to simulate a local chain. So this is not even actually starting a node. This is this is sort of lower than that. It's just starting a, a local session in the Clarity virtual machine, which is pretty cool. So I can see that there's one contract that's being deployed right here, and it has a bunch of functions. And I also also see that the trade is deployed, which of course you have to because you have to be able to reference to this trade. So trades are actually deployed as contracts as well. Um, I have some standard balances, so the deployer and a bunch of wallets I initialized. That's all fine. So what we want to do is we want to call into this contract which we can do. So let's try that out real quick before I'm actually out of time. So I'm going to identify this contract and say, for example, that I want to call into the mint function and I want to mint a token for myself. So I'm going to say mint it to TX sender. I see now here that an event is emitted. So NFT mint event uh, with a bunch of information and I get an OKU1. So it means that NFT with uh, an ID of one has been minted. Let's try that again. I'll get it U2. Right, so we can now call into get owner. Let's see who is the owner of actually uh, token number one. We see that there's some owner, right? Token number thousand doesn't exist. So who am I? I'm TX sender, which is equal to this particular address right here. So I'd be able to check out these two and make sure that that's correct. And then finally, let's try and transfer one of these tokens to a different principle here. So I'm gonna call into my NFT contract. I'm gonna pick say wallet number one, and I'm gonna say transfer. Let's take a look at what transfer actually looks like. So token ID, the sender and the recipient. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna transfer token with ID one, let's do two, why not? The sender is myself, so I can just fill in the sender. The recipient is going to be this different address. Uh, and then I'm missing the contract name for the call. Obviously I need to pass in the function name. So that's there, I get a transfer event. Great, so let's see who the owner is now. Get owner for token two. And that is now someone else. It's no longer myself. And I can check the current asset maps here. 
and actually see that the de deployer, so myself, owns one of these tokens and wallet number one owns another one of these tokens. And that's my super quick intro in writing a SIP9 NFT on Stacks. Thank you. I'm sure lots of questions. What the hell is Lisp? What the hell is Clarity? We'll get to that. 